So for anybody um, else who doesn't know me uh, yet, my name is um, Edward and I'm one of the pastors of Grace Church. Um, and it's a great pleasure to um, uh, speak to you this morning um, in the first of a new series, as Graham says, um, looking at suffering and what the Christian faith has to say about um, suffering. It's a short series, but a topical one. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to explain to anybody why we're doing this now. I think it's really clear, isn't it? Um, even from the uh, WhatsApp group um, on the road that we live in, that 2020 has shown us that we all suffer. And I wonder, how have you responded to suffering in 2020? Perhaps you didn't go quite so far as to make a new Netflix film called Death to 2020, but why do you think all that suffering happened? What has it shown you about yourself? Where did you turn when things went wrong? We're given a really good example of where to turn in times of suffering uh, from 12 years a slave, where Northup is reminded of a miraculous escape. And he says this, um, hopefully it will come up on the screen um, if, um, if that's possible. He says this, uh, Ford interrogated me in regard to the various fears and emotions I had experienced during the day and night, and if I had felt at any time a desire to pray. I felt forsaken of the whole world, I answered him, and was praying mentally all the while. At such times, the heart of man turns instinctively towards his maker. In prosperity, and whenever there's nothing to injure or make him afraid, he remembers him not and is ready to defy him. But place him in the midst of dangers, cut him off from human aid, let the grave open before him, then it is, in the time of his tribulation, that the scoffer and unbelieving man turns to God for help, feeling there is no other hope or refuge or safety save in his protecting arm. So what can I say about your uh, suffering? Well, I'm certainly not preaching on this topic because I've suffered more than anyone else. And I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I can sympathize and understand because I have suffered and because we all suffer. But more importantly, I'm here to share with you that the Bible has got a lot to say. God speaks into our suffering. He gives us many examples of his people who have suffered and has himself in Jesus Christ entered our world of suffering. But this wasn't just to show that he cares and understands, though he does. It was with a bigger purpose to defeat the enemies that cause our suffering. God speaks to, into suffering in a, in, in a powerful and a personal way. On the one hand, he is powerful to bring an end to suffering. He's promised to do this, um, as Tom um, said um, earlier, and he's given us a foretaste of it with the healing ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. So he is powerful. On the other hand, he is personal, not only drawing alongside us in our suffering, but able to sympathize us with us in our weakness and in our trials, because he suffered too, Jesus suffered. I think the big problem with the question of suffering is that we all experience it in such different ways and to different degrees but also because we'll naturally base what we think about it on the specific situation we're in. It's almost impossible, isn't it, to avoid this when we're in the midst of suffering or overwhelmed by pain. In the heat of suffering, many of us feel confused and upset because, well, suffering seems so wrong, so pointless, 
And we, we don't always know how to deal with it or, or process it. Fred reminded us last week that we, um, for Christians, we, we sort of flip between good and bad circumstances. Yet for Christians, there is that one constant, like a star, always shining brightly, even if we can't see it, and despite the darkness that covers our world. And that's the hope of Jesus Christ, um, the hope that he holds out to us. And as Tom said earlier in his video, Jesus will return to put an end to all suffering. That's God's promise. And he always stays true to his promises. So we're going to look at some common uh, mistakes we can make about suffering. I think that's, uh, if we'd like to put the next um, slide up, that'd be really helpful. Some common mistakes we can make about um, suffering. And we're going to let the Bible speak into them. Not only to help us understand what's going on and, and what God's role and purpose is in all of that but also because God speaks hope into the situation. He gives us something concrete and dependable to hold on to. Without this foundation, suffering can end up leading us away from God, questioning his goodness, rather than prompting us to trust in him and depend on him. I think getting our heads and hearts right about these things can make all the difference when suffering comes so we know who to turn to and what to hold on to. Later on in this series, we'll um, spend much more time thinking about how to cope with suffering. But for, for today, I want to focus on these three things we can get wrong about suffering and see what the Bible has to say about them. So the first one then, that suffering um, is uh, random or th suffering um, is abnormal uh, so that's the first one and of course it's true isn't it that suffering is wrong it's evil it's not how things are meant to be and the bible is full of faithful followers of god uh, who had doubts and asked big questions uh, of god uh, so many psalms that begin with why lord or how long lord Some suffering can be um, a direct consequence of sin. Um, and this is really well illustrated, I think, in The Lion King. When Simba is shown um, the kingdom and told to avoid going outside the borders, he's, he's um, then deceived by his uncle Scar. Um, and he's tempted into that dangerous territory, isn't he, of the hyenas. Nevertheless, after saving him from that, his father, Mufasa, reminds Simba. He says, you deliberately disobeyed me. When we go against God and do things he warns us against, there are consequences. But I would probably say that most suffering is not our fault. It's not a direct result of our own sin. Uh, I think Jesus himself makes this clear when he's talking about a couple of local tragedies. Uh, he says this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. Um, Do you think that those Galilean people who were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? No, I tell you. The suffering I imagine we will be wrestling with most is the kind that comes from other people sinning against us or what seems like the random tragedy of sudden loss or overwhelming circumstances. But the, uh, these verses, um, the verses that we just saw on the screen, um, if we can have them back, that'd be fantastic, um, from uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7. Thanks so much for that. Uh, the, these verses from Ecclesiastes um, 7 remind us that suffering is not random. God allows both the good and the bad to happen to us. And that is what we should expect. 
In fact, the wisdom literature of the Bible more widely has a lot to say about this. Probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible is a staggering response to suffering from Job. Even when Job has just found out about the sudden death of all his children, he is able to say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised or blessed be the name of the Lord. When tragedy hits like that, we need to wonder where such incredible faith and dependence on God come from. It's not a given, is it? Because even Job's wife definitely does not react in the same way with faith in God. But there's a big assumption in the Bible that after the fall, suffering is to be expected, especially for Christians. 2 Timothy uh, verse 3, the Apostle Paul, after listing uh, the, the places he was mistreated um, for preaching the gospel, he says to Timothy, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Both good and bad are allowed by God, and no one is given a free pass to a pain-free life. More than this, Christians shouldn't think that seeking a comfortable and easy life and avoiding suffering is what we should be expecting. Again, Paul says that he's learned to be content whatever the circumstances, in plenty and in want. Depending on God in, in difficult circumstances is a demonstration of our trust in him as our Heavenly Father. We show that he is truly first in our lives and that we depend on him. I suppose in some ways, suffering is like um, a testing ground for our faith. It's easy enough to say we trust God, but it's another thing altogether to put that into practice when times are tough. When we suddenly find ourselves without money or without a job, losing family, or friends, diagnosed with a, a long-term illness. Does any of that sound familiar to you? In those moments, what do we think about why we suffer? Think of a marriage. Uh, during the ceremony, a husband and wife pronounce some very serious vows, promising to stick with each other through thick and thin uh, in uh, sickness and in health. But it's only when hard times come that this is put to the test and shown to be genuine. Testing circumstances reveal our true loyalties. Suffering is God's school of discipline. In the case of Job, God established that Job loved and trusted him purely because he is God not for the blessings he received at God's hands. And Paul, um, the person who, apart from Jesus, seems to suffer the most adverse circumstances in the New Testament, he practiced a discipleship pattern that emphasized the normal human experience of suffering. New church leaders and disciples needed to learn how to suffer in a godly way. His first letter to Timothy invites um, this young trainee pastor to join him in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, I do want to be careful here because um, I realize that in much of the New Testament, suffering means being persecuted for the faith. But given that Paul also suffered from shipwrecks, hunger, cold, desertion from friends, imprisonment, and many physical trials. His example is certainly relevant for us here. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that other Christians don't suffer or that your experience is unique. We may try to put a brave face on it. We might keep calm and carry on. We might give the impression that everything's fine. <clears throat> 
but the reality is that we all suffer. So I would urge everyone to be honest with God in prayer and with your community group and pastors so that you don't go through trials on your own. We need to carry each other's burdens, but we'll only do this well when we acknowledge that the normal pattern is to carry our cross and follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, who is described in the Bible as a man of suffering and familiar with pain. That's how Isaiah puts it. Those who don't believe in God, um, they struggle with this question too, of course they do. But the world has no answers. Many people, even famous atheists, ironically, will get angry with God because of the suffering they see around them or, or in Africa, for example. But this doesn't answer the question. In fact, it usually means they don't have a problem with God's existence. They have a problem with God's goodness. They think God isn't good. And that's um, the objection I'll, I'll, I will address um, in a moment. So when suffering comes, their answer might be to invest every effort um, in, in stifling it with, with, uh, with drugs, with entertainment, with overwork, a um, whole variety of things. Or it might be to vent their anger against COVID, against Brexit, against global warming, against God, whatever they feel is responsible for suffering. Some are more honest about the lack of an answer. The Japanese writer Haruki um, Marahami, um, for example, says it very ble bleakly. He says, there's nothing so cruel in this world as the desolation of having nothing to hope for. But these verses uh, from Ecclesiastes, written thousands of years ago, they hold out so much more hope and a solid foundation for living our lives. They, they remind us that suffering is not random. It's not an accident. It's not unique to me. And it's not out of control even if it's out of my control. But why would a good God allow suffering in the first place? That leads us on to our second, um, second objection, I guess, or second uh, misunderstanding about suffering. Uh, if we could see the next slide, that'd be fantastic. So suffering uh, means uh, God isn't good. It might not be the first thing that you see from these verses, but God puts limits on suffering. No doubt it's always more than we think we can bear, but it's always less than we deserve. Adam and Eve deserved to, di to die for their disobedience, for believing the serpent's lies uh, in bold there um, at, at the beginning. Um, for failing to trust in God's provision for them. As you can see from the verses there on the screen, they ate the fruit in full knowledge that God warned them that they would die. But God is good. Because although they had to suffer the consequences of their sin, they still lived. And even better than that, he promises in these verses an end to suffering. A day when a descendant of Adam and Eve would overcome the serpent and triumph over evil. And this is the Bible's first prediction of Jesus's victory over death and Satan and gives great hope even in the midst of trial and pain, even in the midst of the curses uh, that God pronounced on uh, the ground um, and um, Adam and Eve. Also, look at Jesus. He's God's only beloved son. Jesus obeyed God perfectly. He never sinned. He is one with God, bringing God glory. Yet he suffered. In fact, he suffered more than anyone has done before or will do again. So we simply cannot conclude that God the Father is not good or not good to Jesus 
quite the opposite. He conferred the greatest glory and authority on Jesus when he raised him from the dead after he suffered. Now, what we learn from this is that extraordinary good can come out of the worst possible circumstances, such as the cross of Christ. That horrific torture that resulted in the salvation of all who would believe in him. I think this objection, suffering means God isn't good, I think it is legitimate if God has done nothing about suffering, but he has. Jesus's ministry uh, was a very powerful and personal demonstration of God's love for the hurting, for the excluded, for those who had least or had lost most, those suffering in mind and body. He drew alongside the suffering and brought a solution, both immediate evidence of his power to heal and a promise of an eternity free from suffering. He achieved this by rising to new life, overcoming our biggest enemies and the cause of our suffering, sin, death, and the devil. So God is good, but surely suffering itself has no purpose. That's our third um, objection that I'm addressing, or third misunderstanding, which is suffering is just a waste. Suffering seems senseless, doesn't it? It involves so much loss and, and pain that can't be forgotten. Sometimes it may last a lifetime, as with long-term illness or, or grief at the loss of a, of a baby, a parent, or separation within families, or tragedy, or natural disasters such as the landslides and earthquakes uh, that have hit other countries even this week, to say nothing of the persecution of Christians or other victims of terrorism. And I think pat, pat answers to this are, are no help to the suffering. If someone says to you when things are going very badly, everything will be okay. How do they know? Will it? Or maybe you hear a verse quoted out of context. Don't worry, God won't give you more than you can bear. Well, firstly, that's really talking about temptation, not suffering. And anyway, the problem is that our experience of the suffering is usually that it is unbearable. It feels impossible to bear. But even suffering is used by God to prepare his people for eternity. Both good and bad serve God's purposes of testing his people's faith. Just as 40 years in the desert were needed to see whether the Israelites were just paying lip service to God or whether they really trusted and worshipped him above all others. Many of them clearly thought this was pointless and they grumbled against God and against Moses. But God's timing was perfect and he established his faithful people in the new promised land. In the same way in these verses from Romans, Paul says that God's people now are to wait patiently for the hope set before them, not being disheartened because they can't see it yet, but holding on to God's promises on the strength of his past faithfulness. We know, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God has big purposes in our pain. It's said that when people are in great difficulty, such as fighting in war or, or dealing with a fatal illness, that that's when you see what they're really made of. The Bible says something similar. It says that when trouble comes, when we're in pain, that is when whatever, is when whatever our lives are based on is exposed. Who do we trust? Where do we go to to find answers? Who do we cry out to? 
So how do I deal with all of this? How do I re- live and, and relate to God in all of this? Well, this series is going to dig deep into these questions. I think the biggest challenge uh, for me is to keep trusting God, even when I don't have all the answers about why such bad things are allowed to happen. I lost my mum very suddenly at the end of last summer. She suffered a stroke and wasn't alive long enough in hospital for me to get back from abroad and see her. The loss is real, it's cruel. Nothing I can do will bring her back. And actually most of the time I can't believe that she's gone. The battle to believe is a daily one. But because of Jesus, I have hope. I know that death is not the end and that there's a life to come that will be free from all suffering. And I'm reminded of Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders. When the storm comes and it comes on both those who know God and those who don't know God, when the storm comes, it exposes our foundation. What does it mean to build your house upon the rock? Well, it's all about trusting God, about knowing that he has good purposes for us, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And it's about an immovable hope, that final triumph over all evil, suffering and pain achieved in the resurrection of Jesus and which we will experience fully when he comes back. So speak to God in prayer, cry out to him, ask him for help and for justice. Don't hide your doubts and questions, but above all, trust in him. Know that he has important spiritual work to do with you in your suffering. He wants you to rely on him, to humble yourself under his mighty arm, um, as the apostle Peter puts it. God doesn't promise to give us all the answers, but he does promise that he has set a day when all suffering will be over for those who put their faith in him. God speaks to us powerfully and personally when we suffer. So let's listen to him and depend on him.